Ryan, how are you, my friend? I'm doing great, Ryan. How are you doing, my friend? Good. I like I said, I we won't uh, cover exactly how the whole world works in 30 minutes, but uh, we're yeah. gonna try and uh, hit the tip of the iceberg. And um, I'm one of the one of the places I wanted to start is with the ITR forecast and talking about where you guys are tracking the 2024 recession, mild recession, how that goes into 2025, and why I think it's so um, interesting. And I thought you and Keith and your guys' webinar with Butcher Joseph did an amazing job of really framing it up of like what people should be thinking about because if they don't see like it's either all catastrophe like you are always talking about with the news or it's all upside and i think with your kind of my like how you're project or projecting into the recession and then the 2025 will uh, frame this up so maybe kind of give us an overview of that um the kind of the forecast of what you're seeing for 2024 and then we'll dive into that okay sure um, we're still looking at a mild downturn in 2024, and we're still in 2023 as we record this. And uh, manufacturing's already slipped below year ago levels. Industrial production has turned down in general. Europe's in uh, recession. Uh, the leading indicators that had been rising have curled back down into decline, as we thought they might. Uh, yet you'll still hear pundits out there saying, See, we told you there was not going to be a recession. Well, they, they, had, the, they had the timeline wrong, uh, is what it boils down to. One of uh, Keith Butcher's lines that I loved was, never waste a good recession. I know. And, I uh, loved it. I know, right? And this is going to be one of those good recessions, because it's not a wall banger. It's not going to put you on the mat. Um, but it is going to make other people hesitate. It's going to make them wonder because they're not seeing it coming, they're not understanding how it's coming, and therefore that creates some opportunities for people, entrepreneurs, to really move forward and grab some opportunities, particularly since, um, particularly in the second half of 25 and 26 and following years, we see the U.S. economy rising. So keep your eye on the prize, take advantage of the opportunities mm -hmm. during the weak spot, and next thing you know, Bob's your uncle. Which <laughs> I love it. So, which, 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 Brian, I think is so crucial about this mindset because, you know, with the 2030 Great Depression and you're just the human brains grab the negativity, but like it's your book's title is Prosperity in the Age of Decline. <laughs> so, like, and like, you know, it's not like I think I, when people are starting to see that coming closer, they're, I, I'm watching people project, like, hey, you know, there's negativity now extrapolating that to 2030 and if they bet on that wrong right it's like it's not the next six years and then all of the decision making could be wrong if they're thinking about like hey this is the decline straight into 2030 so i think it's super important and when you would you were talking about like mild recession soft landing but then you would you had said specifically but elevated volatility so can you, can you speak to how you can have a mild recession but elevated vol volatility I think we're going to see that volatility in the financial markets uh, in particular, uh, because they don't know which way to look, go right now. So uh, you tend to get whipsawed along that way. But even in oil, uh, the volatility is there. Even in, with this Israeli-Hamas war, and I prefer to say it's the Hamas-Israeli war, um, where oil hasn't gone ratcheting upward, it's come down five, six bucks. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's like, I saw under three bucks. <laughs> so it's like that's the volatility I'm uh, I'm talking about because while well, people are looking at the war and thinking, well, this could really drive prices higher with the world slipping into negative territory, and the world is, um, the demand is slipping, and we're getting that downside volatility instead of the upside volatility. And when you're looking, as you were saying, when you're looking this way and it actually goes the other way, uh, you can get a really spring neck real fast because you're not looking at it. <laughs> well, and, it, and it's all about perspective. And that's what I think you're, you're really helping people with is that perspective, like how to make the decision and how to put it into context. And Yes, the volatility could be short term, but there's going to be the overall trend of what you're right. saying. Like look into look into the 2025. Um, you had mentioned uh, the wholesale trade has been falling since 2023. I found that fascinating um, because I don't know, you know, coming from my old uh, space of being a distributor or like watching people's inventory of our clients. Like, can you speak to like why that's fascinating? One of the indicators and what people can drive from that. Well, I can't explain why you think it's fascinating, but. Uh... <laughs> I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just think I think it's fascinating. Can you can you explain why that's important as far as your guys' leading indicators? 
it isn't a leading indicator. It's a coincident indicator. Uh, it, okay. it has been coming down right along with manufacturing uh, easing downward and overall industrial activity easing downward. Part of it is, and you need to be careful, part of it is the, the price softness that has crept in, right? That's a nominal dollar series. So as you get disinflation, and that's quite real, you're going to get smaller percentages year over year. But it's gone beyond that because we're seeing excess inventories mm -hmm. up there now, and that's the more dangerous spot. And that's what makes the trend for us anyways in wholesale trade uh, all the more worrisome. You know, in that third and quarter that, GDP... Oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that's that's why I actually like to put context of why I thought it was fascinating is because of the correlation with inventory. If everybody's got inventory, then there there's a whole the whole set of trades going to be going down. So like, and I'm watching like with all like we've I've uh, been working with a lot of rep manu rep manufacturer groups where like they're trying to figure out it's like they're the the whipsaw that they're on from inventory like there's not an inventory there's no inventory then there's too much and like they're the ones responsible yeah. for selling it in all these different sectors and it's really the roller coaster is real for them. Yeah, and, and if you're, I'm glad you referenced what it was like. This is, we're still in what we call the COVID echo, right? COVID mm -hmm. made everything crazy in the supply chain. Now we're on the other side of crazy, but that's in an excess situation because of the COVID echo. And it, it can drive you crazy. I was going to say the third quarter GDP numbers was an interesting case in point, Ryan, because uh, it came out, you know, but ooh, it's so strong. Uh, stronger than anticipated, like the no recession. So because I'm a numbers guy like you, I tore the thing apart. And uh, the number one reason uh, we saw that surge in GDP was personal consumption expenditures for household. Uh, so that would be rent, utilities. Uh, these are not discretionary items, right? right Healthcare right. is in there. Uh, so that takes away from discretionary spending, but it makes GDP look pretty darn good. The second largest driver of that GDP figure in the third quarter was inventories, non-farm inventories shot up. And I know how GDP is calculated. It's considered an investment that makes GDP go up. But I tell you what, I mean, you do you know anybody running a business that wants to see inventories rising at this particular time? I mean, this is not a good sign. Yeah, yeah. Well, in I, we don't have to go down this rabbit hole and maybe we, we can pick this up on uh, one of our future discussions. But like when I started uh, diving further into like what consists of GDP, how much noise is in there and how it's just this, you know, absolute indicator that everybody's looking for. Like when I found out that, and you know, I might be wrong, but credit default swaps were counted as GDP. I'm like, well, that's not creating cash flow. And it, 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 and so, like, and I don't know if I'm right or wrong with that, but I feel there was a book that I read, um, Makers and Takers. They're they're talking about some a lot of the financial products that you know that Wall Street is you know that th that they're involved in that counts as part of GDP. And I'm like, well, that's not increasing cash flow of companies. And I think this, it, and I might be wildly wrong, Brian, but like, I, and well, it must be included as a as part of the financial services component of uh, GDP. Okay. And I think that's I think regardless of it, your point is. What is it, what are we gathering from that, and what is consisting of the increase of GDP and increased inventory and non discretionary spending is not a good thing because then people have less money, <laughs> which is the entire exactly. trying, uh, trying to point. And by the way, uh, a negative on that third quarter GDP that no one talked about was capital good expenditures went down. We we invested less in capital equipment in the third quarter, which is something that we saw coming because of the high interest rates. People are mm -hmm. deferring putting off those capex expenditures, none of which bodes particularly well for the future, uh, and that future being 2024. So then continuing on the consumer track, um, you, there was mention about the consumer delinquencies raising a little bit that was in your uh, um, in some of the, the reports, as well as then the I saw this, I don't know if this was uh, the mainstream stuff, but uh, the credit availability is decreasing as well. So what, what, what is there any I mean, that's not a good thing. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, it's not a good thing. Uh, yeah, the Federal Reserve surveys senior loan officers in the banking system, and they report whether credit conditions are getting tighter or looser. And they are uh, tight to the level in the past that has always meant recession. So uh, we are at recession-inducing levels of credit tightness. 
And what that means is if you're running a business, unless you have a very strong balance sheet, you're probably not going to get any leverage going. And you may find out that your line of credit's being shrunk rather than expanded, which is what you may need. The mm -hmm. takeaway there is uh, being proactive businesses. If they haven't already, they should do a very good 12, 18 month pro forma on their cash flow, their cash needs, because that credit won't loosen up for at least another year. So the, the, the conditions that we're currently faced with are the ones that we have to deal with for at least a year. Mm. Again, important for the context of 2024, 2025 and the decision making. Um, you and Keith in your webinar, I I don't know how you framed it up, but you I think you called it balance sheet battles or something like that with how is it was that my on track, but I loved how you were talking about how companies are having balance sheet battles based on AP, AR, and inventory. Can you explain what you meant by that? Because I thought it was just brilliant how you guys framed that up. Oh, well, it's very common right now uh, for uh, people to say, well, I'm not going to pay you uh, not in 90 days. I'll pay it 120 days, 150 days, because now the cost of money is very real. So they want to hold on to their cash because it has a return and they expect you to go without the cash. Um, so you're you're financing their ability to make money by not by foregoing the opportunity for yourself. And Keith is saying, and I, I repeated it many times, um, say if it's an important enough uh, relationship. Okay, I understand that, but I need a 3.5 percent price increase to cover the cost of money. It won't cover all of it, but at least I can I can make it happen on my side with a three and a half percent price increase. And that price increase isn't going to go away. So take the deal it's, and minimize it's the bill. Brilliant. <laughs> it's, it's seriously brilliant. Well, and I like when I want to, and again, back to even your book, Make Your Move, is like these are just, it's just a different level of game mm -hmm. when then everybody else is just trying to sell more revenue at a specific, you know, gross profit margin. And then they're just looking at their income statement. And I think, you know, we're constantly highlighting how the three statements and the cash flow statement, understanding how this works is, I mean, whether people know it or not, the bigger players that are their suppliers or their customers are playing it. So you're either recognizing it or not, but the game is going on. Oh, yeah, and I think you guys gave well, some great ideas. And how about when people come to you and say, I, I want you to take a 10% price cut? Yeah, Keith and I talked about that. And some people are caught flat-footed and don't know what to do about it. They don't have a counter argument. And others say, well, I understand why you're saying that steel is down or iron is down or whatever is down. But that's only about 13% of my material costs here. There's all this labor, electricity isn't down, trucking costs aren't down. Uh, so no, I can't do the 10%. And it was Keith's experience uh, that they'll say, oh, okay, well, how about 2%? They'll go ahead to somebody else for 12% just to make it up. <laughs> well, and, and, and it, it's, just, it's just brilliant and like it's it's again this is getting the game is getting played and like i if people don't know this when that phone call happens how are you supposed to negotiate you know what i mean like it, 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 and they just know yeah so i i think it's very very important and then make your boom book i'll tell everybody to go pick that up again because i think those uh there's a lot of um major tactical things in the in that book um uh, going back to banks brian and like their lending like Help, help me understand like so the inverted yield curve has been going on for a long time now and like how is the inverted yield curve and like the what loans are on the bank's balance sheets how like how with all the rates and where the the loans are at right now and what people could get how is this impacting just the bank's business model i mean is it in in seriously impacted the bank's business model initially is because they were into um heavily into the long bond side of things. Those mm -hmm. were the bond banks. And when uh, the inversion happened, uh, they were on the wrong side of, you know, the, the plus minus on that uh, relationship between short-term money and long-term. It's also impacting banks adversely because people started taking money out of the banks because why would why, why, why to put it into your bank uh, to earn half a percent when I can put it into a 90-day treasury yeah. and yeah. make two and a half percent or three percent. Mm -hmm. So they were getting killed that way. Banks coming out of COVID were flush with cash. 
Now, the best way to get a loan from a bank is to say, oh, and by the way, I'll make a deposit of half a million dollars into your bank. Okay, now I'm going to talk to you about giving you a loan. Yeah, it's funny because I actually had a friend where the bank called him up and said, hey, do you have any cash that you can put into my bank? <laughs> and, yeah. and like, yeah. And, and so it's a case in point. And so do I have this right, Brian? Where like with, with So like if you have a balance sheet, a, a bank has a balance sheet with now with the treasuries, with the, the rates where they're at, I mean, it devalues their balance sheet with the loans, you know, and and again, the mark to market is a whole nother thing, like how they have to adjust that. But like, if they had to sell it all, they'd have to discount their loans because of how low they are. So they, their balance sheet got erosion and then their cash flow from the fact that they're having to pay people to track deposits. I'm just sitting there going, well, that doesn't sound like a business model I want to be, be in. So like, what, yeah, what, what kind the, of risk is that? The there? big banks are fine. They really are. Uh, they know yeah. how to play this game. It's the re- some of the regional and some of the small banks are really going to get banged up because of this and won't survive uh, this period, especially when you factor in on top of everything you just said with their balance sheets, uh, the impending commercial real estate debacle uh, heading a, to a bank a near good the- word you <laughs> too, Jones. <laughs> um, <laughs> It, well, and, and and what this means for the business owners listening in is their ability to get the line of credit, to get the, the loan that they're looking for, right? So what are some of the conversations that owners should be having with banks? If, I mean, like trying to, you know, kind of like what you're talking about, the balance sheet battles with their suppliers and customers, right. like, is there something that the conversations or questions they could be asking to have a different kind of conversation with banks? Well, if it's a, one that you've had a long-term relationship with, uh, make sure that you maintain that relationship and ask before you need the money. I mean, what, Bob, what would I have to do to expand my line of credit? And if you and Bob go back a long way, he'll let you know whether it's possible or not. But you know, there are, are third-party bank rating agencies out there. Two or three of them are very good. And they'll tell you whether the, the bank you're favorite bank is on the uh, uh-oh list or if they're on the strong list. And uh, you're much better off being with a strong bank than you are a marginally positive bank. So mm-hmm. use those agencies as rating services. And the names escape me at the moment, Ryan, and I apologize. If you remind me, I'll have them for next yeah, time. I'll, I'll reach out to Lindsay and the team to see what they are, and I'll put them in the show notes because I think it's you know, kind of one of the the approaches that we're constantly promoting is like having a mature conversation with a bank, understanding their business model, understanding what you're asking for, um, instead of just asking for increased line and asking for increased debt, because you just need to keep, you know, another year going. And, and it's just a totally different conversation. Um, how is a kind of moving on to like how the Fed and the Treasury are managing like their th- their thoughts around this, like some of the things that I, I, I dropped into our notes is like the Fed's mandate is low employment, and we're so they that and they're looking for declining corporate profits too. So like, what are they thinking about, and how does that impact like what's really going on? Like how they're gonna keep rates for longer, uh, rates higher for longer? But how how are you thinking about, or is it even possible to understand what they're thinking at this point? <laughs> <laughs> You know, it, there's hope because um, there's they went from being very aggressive in their actions and in their wording to becoming more thoughtful, more balanced, which is what you'd expect to see. And now they're saying they went from rise, 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 rise to maybe rise. Now we're going to hold. But we're going to keep them high. Um, that been there, done that, seen that play so many times before. Um, there's a 60% probability that in at the May 1st meeting, the Fed will actually lower interest rates 25 or 50 basis points based on the data. Yeah, uh, That's what the futures market is, uh, is telling us. So this thought about that they won't be lowering interest rates, I, I find doesn't hold water. It's not how life works, and it's not the way the financial markets are moving, and they tend to be very good at indicating which way the Fed's going to be moving. And if we're right about retail sales, GDP, manufacturing, the rest of the world, and with inflation continuing to come down, it's not going to be hard for them to to lower 25 or 50 pips. Yeah, that makes sense. They'll do it again. 
they have always had in their doc uh, map uh, a 50 to 150 basis point decline in interest rates in 2024. So they're going to be able to say, this is nothing new, nothing we haven't thought about, nothing we haven't planned for. Um, and 150 bit decline makes a big difference when you talk about mortgages, when you talk mm -hmm. about a bunch of, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, and I don't know if this is a too deep of, of a of a topic to tackle, but like when I think about like their the Fed's mandate for unemployment and, or out for employment and the 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 issue with just um, with how difficult it is for people to make a like living wage. How, how does that? How does the, like a long term debt cycle? Maybe I'm not thinking about this the right way, but like. How does the fact that people just need to go to work to make some money impact the Fed's mandate? Because it's like, well, you know, we need some unemployment, but if it's like almost impossible for people to quit or they're like getting multiple jobs where it doesn't show up in numbers and there's so much noise in the employment numbers, like how should we be thinking about the unemployment numbers and what that, what, what's happening with that compared in relationship with what the Fed's doing? The unemployment number is showing that there's been some layoff activity and it's not as robust uh, a jobs market as it was before, but it's still relatively robust. Part of the Fed's mandate is maximizing employment, minimizing inflation. And they'll say, and they have said, but we can't maximize employment until we minimize until we minimize inflation so that's the variable that they focus on in order to got achieve it. their other goal got it got it super helpful um you uh let's see here um i think uh getting your perspective on resilient companies i think it would be very helpful because i think that's what everybody that's listening in is trying to build so what would be your definition of a resilient company my definition of one is uh, a, a company that is constantly adapting, constantly looking for internal and external disruptors and uh, capitalizing on them. But if you're not constantly adapting to the changes around you, uh, then you are constantly losing ground to somebody else. Uh, so uh, to me, it's more than resilience. It's uh, being the winner, the big dog at the end of the day, uh, rather than just still hanging around because you were resilient I like it i like it and, and i think that kind of goes back to the uh, first part of the conversation which is the goal is to succeed in all this <laughs> it's not to focus on the negativity it's the the people that aren't paying attention bummer for them kind of i mean like to say it <laughs> as clearly as possible i mean in, in um you, you and keith had talked about an example about uh, one of their portfolio companies. I think it was a, uh, is it a washing machine manufacturer or something like that? And like some of the decisions that people could be making of like, I think it was like higher end washers or dryers are not as, you know, that's coming down, but the lower end ones are coming up because of multifamily. It, maybe like, how should people be thinking about the mix of their products and services as they're paying attention to other trends, because I thought, do you know which example I was talking about? Yeah, uh, I do. Uh, they manufacture a part for uh, oh, one of the part, large yeah. washing machine uh, uh, manufacturers. When Keith went over that, I was thinking, I understand where he's coming from, and I'm sure that it's true, but it's not going to be true in every instance. So what I suggest to businesses is, and it wasn't that long ago, go back to 2016 and 17. What changed in your marketplace? Um, what did you notice about your market mix changing? Now, if you're in the oil field, don't go back there because that was an utter disaster. But for everybody else, um, that's a reasonably recent time frame that you can go back, you can look at the, uh, the data, and you can ask yourself, how did my market mix change during 15, 16, 17, and now the second half of 17, 18, when we were ramping back up, what changes did I notice then? And what am I going to do with that knowledge this time? Well, like am I that. going to adapt? Yeah, very helpful because then it, it, it's actionable for those specific people listening in, not to washers and drivers. <laughs> but I thought it was a really good example. And and uh, sure. Jeff and I talked about it. And as we're rounding out. Before you, before you go ahead, Brian, it, just think about what we just said, though. Individual businesses have to do this for themselves. There's not one size fits all. There's no easy answer. There's no politicians going to take care of it. It's up to the individual business to go do the hard work and think it through. 
And those are the ones that are going to thrive. You know, on that note, Brian, like, because with all the, the workshops that I've been doing this year, like, it's been really encouraging for me because I think we're around, I'm, I'm rounding up to 40 Vistage workshops this year. And like, the people that are doing hard work and paying attention are going to succeed. And I think yeah. like, all the easy BS that was going on over the last four years. I'm like, I, I just, I think about how insane I must have sounded like cash flow matters, intrinsic financial value. Yeah. And people are like free money's everywhere. Ryan's yeah. crazy. And I'm like, <laughs> but I like it, it. There's like this level of like saneness. <laughs> I think that's coming back yeah. where it's like the hard work will get rewarded over time. And I like, I'm, I truly believe that. And I think you just highlighted that. And it's like, go back to your own company. What happened? Do the hard work because it's, it's not all doom. It's like there's going the yeah. demands out there. People are going to be buying stuff, and where are you going to be playing? And make sure you're getting more than your fair share of it. That's yeah, good, right. Make it. <laughs> yep. Um. The last, uh, just kind of comment I, I'd love to hear is like with uh with all the geopolitical stuff going on right now, is there things that you're or trends or indicators that you're seeing about like the de decoupling of supply chains and onshoring and like you know how what, what what's is there kind of some movement going on as far oh, as oh yeah uh, tectonic plate type movement okay um uh, uh, the china and the united states economically are they're not just subtly drifting apart they are moving apart fairly uh, noticeably uh we're replacing um a lot of that with stuff we can get now from europe instead europe's now our number one source of imports in the united states not china and um isn't mexico like i saw a chart recently where like yeah some of the stuff that chinese are shipping into mexico and it's just coming up from mexico <laughs> into the united states the trojan horse kind of move right yeah, yeah. and uh, that's how uh, it's really hard for the government to push back on you know um it's not an easy process got it but you look at china and the way they're cracking down on uh entrepreneurs and on capitalism and and how they're funneling more and more money into the state-owned enterprises and the leverage that they have built up is mind-blowing. At the same time where their demographic trend is overtly negative, um, I think, you know how when a boat sinks, uh, you wanna swim away from the boat or else you're gonna get pulled down with it? Uh -huh. I see the United States moving away from China because we don't wanna get pulled down along with them. The more we're divorced from them, the less it matters when that ships. I love well said. And I think that's where people should go back and look at their own situation of where are their suppliers, manufacturers, and customers coming from. And apparently you have to go three levers, three layers deep. So you're not, it's still not in China that you're getting yeah. from. Yeah. Um, well, think, of, think about this though. Um, what's going to happen when, I mean, China has a major issue with us when they do, if they do, What's that going to mean to BMW and BMW stock and Tesla stock and Volkswagen stock and a whole mm -hmm. bunch of other stocks that are name brands here in the United States? Um, it did not. It did not escape me when I watched the standing applause for Xi Jinping with all the big corporate companies. <laughs> They're gone. Uh, uh, I'm watching this. So yeah, amen to that. Um, is there anything that anything else that you wanted to mention before we wrap up? Uh, Alan and I are having a uh, webinar on December 12th about the Great Depression, and they were taking a slightly different uh, tack to it this time or a uh, way to look at it. We're really doing it by age. You know, this 30s thing is going to mean one thing for boomers, another thing for Gen X, another thing for millennials. So we're slicing it down that way. Awesome. And uh, you know, Kimberly and Lindsay sent me a promo code. So for the listeners, and I'll be I'll be mentioning this at the beginning of the podcast, too. So we've got something for the listeners to join into that. And I love how you put that, too, because I'm thinking about it a lot differently than some of our sure. clients. <laughs> And, sure. Um, I get. I think it was Alex, one of your uh, older colleagues, or the colleagues from a few years ago. He said, "Yeah, if I was your age, I would buy a company and then grow it and then sell it to someone else that you don't like in 2030." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was, you know, tongue in cheek saying that, but I think it's really helpful to again. What's I, I've been I've been really you know beating this drum, Brian, of target equity valuation at a point in time that you want to hit, 
and then the distri uh, the distributions you want on the way there. So like we have this point A and point B, regardless of what if people want to sell immediately when they get to that point B, they have the options based on the cash flow valuation. And then right. you, I, I like literally believe that if you layer on your 2030 framework and you guys, you and Alan have been putting out a lot of content about how long is it going to last? How does it uh, unfold? So it's not just this finite 2030. It's like this evolving what happens before that. And then after that. And I think um, what you just said, I love, I love the additional layer, the multi dimensions that you're putting to it. Thank you. Thank you. We're excited about it. It's a lot of work, but uh, we think, you know, the whole point of it, and you've mentioned it, is prosperity in the age of decline. And, and the more you understand at the different ages, the more that age is going to be able to prosper mm -hmm. rather than trying to do something that's appropriate for us boomers. Uh, wouldn't be appropriate for somebody like you. Thank you so much for coming on. I just enjoy this so much. So I appreciate your time. Brian, always my pleasure, sir. You take care of yourself, okay? I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Brian. Again, if you want to check out their December 12th, Great Depression 2030 event. There is a promo code Arcona10 in the show notes below. I highly recommend it because your age and your goals will depend on what kind of moves you should make. Another thing that I think would be super important is go check out the Intention Growth Starter Kit. It's free access. And I show in the Starter Kit how to project out the value of a company using all three financial statements because all the stuff we're talking about has to be reconciled against your plan and your timeline so that way if things happen or you have a big decision to make, you can run that scenario against your plan to see how it impacts your plan. And I think you're gonna like that budgeting and annual forecasting and target equity valuation section in the starter kit. And there's also a financial scorecard, a little exercise in a PDF that you can fill out to see what you need to do next in order to level up your financials and get the data that I'm showing in the starter kit. So with that being said, I hope you enjoy the conversation with Jeff from Butcher Joseph. Good morning, Jeff. How are you? Well, Ryan, good morning. How are you? I'm good. I'm good, man. And we were just talking about the nice weather. We're both uh, in the Midwest, so uh, we're counting our blessings as we're uh, kind of watching the clock. Unseasonably um, warm for this time of year, for sure. So uh, we'll take as much as much as we can get, though, right? It is. It is. So I'm I'm excited, Jeff, because you know a lot of people rolling into annual planning right now, and this is going to be good to. And I'm just beating the drum, Jeff, of like, what's your target equity valuation? Revenue is part of it, but the target equity valuation. Let's talk about and that. And I I think Jeff, I've now done uh, I think it's been 40 Visage workshops, and I'm kind of constantly beating the drum of Butcher Joseph and ITR. We're talking about it on the quarterly podcast, and I'm like Jeff and I are talking about normalized EBITDA multiples and deal structures. These are the goals we need to be marching towards. So I'm excited within the context of the annual planning that we're gonna be able to jump into it. Um, anything that you want to kick off? I've got my list of questions, but anything you wanted to kind of just no noteworthy over the last 90 days that you, you want to uh, throw out there? You know, I think um, probably one of the most noteworthy things that we've sort of seen over the last 90 days is um, a little bit of stabilization, I guess, for lack of a better word, at least in the interest rate environment. You know, for the longest time when you and I were chatting, obviously the Fed was really active <laughs> at, at, at increasing interest rates and was doing so at a, at a fairly you know, robust clip, right? And I think um, because of that, uh, you know, that created a lot of uncertainty for business owners, for buyers of businesses, um, just created a lot of delay, right? Because no one really mm -hmm. knew what the velocity was going to be, how much that would continue and for how long that would continue. And I think mm -hmm. the last 90 days, what we've seen is a little bit more visibility, um, you know, just kind of around the pace. And, and yeah. I think the general presumption and understanding is that 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 pace has slowed somewhat. Um, you know, some might I think everybody kind of went, whew. Yeah, some, some, <laughs> might, you know, some might tell you it's slowed completely. Others are probably prognosticating that we might see a decline in interest rates. But I think, it, you know, regardless of where your thoughts are on that, universally, I think people can kind of agree that because of the fact that the, that pace and that velocity sort of stabilized, it's created more certainty kind of around, you know, mm -hmm. what you can expect going forward into 24. Um, at, least like, a tighter, at least within a tighter parameter, right? A tighter band. So why don't you break down for the listeners again, just to make sure that we're constantly highlighting why that matters. Because like if you're yeah. doing a deal and you're financing it, you know, a couple of, you know, half a percent makes a big deal. So like when you're saying like we've seen some of the unthawing, like mm -hmm. when, when, when buyers are thinking about this stuff, how are they determining like, okay, like what does that certainty mean yeah. from a buyer's yeah. lens? 
Well, obviously, you know, why it's important is because when, you, when most buyers buy businesses, they're using debt as a, as a you know, portion of the purchase price. And, and some buyers will use more debt than others, right? And so if you think about the fact that if the debt is costing more, then uh, you're looking at the cash flows of a business on a go forward basis. And it just means as you know, you have a certain amount of cash flows that a company generates, you know, now more of that cash flow has to be directed to going, going interest away. payments, right? Yep. Um, and so if, if more of your cash flow is going to interest payments, at least less, it leaves less left over for other things. And and, right. and and don't you think like even just just knowing how much is going to be, like that's kind of the big question, right? Like like right. We're, we're all kind of under the like yes they're going up, but like if I'm going to build a model, I need to know you know actually how much. I can't be wondering, right? Exactly, and that's it. That's that's exactly it. I mean, you know, it's it, that was part of the uncertainty is you know the Fed was raising interest rates at seventy five basis point instruments and in, at certain points in time, and so you build out your models saying, okay, this is how much of my future cash flows is going to go to interest expense. And I've assumed they're going to continue to rise at a certain pace, but what happens if they rise at a faster pace? Gee, mm -hmm. that doesn't leave me that much more cushion if the cash flows of my business, you know, um, are, are predictable, but what happens mm -hmm. if the cash flows of my business sort of, you know, the company stubs its toe and now I have mm -hmm. even lesser cash flows to cover more yep. interest expense and what happens if the interest expense rises faster than i anticipate <laughs> gee i better rethink this yeah let's just go to the cabin for a little bit take a break you know? and like let's see what happens <laughs> yeah yeah and so now i think you know with, with a little bit more visibility people can kind of you know run their models with greater certainty feel better about the uh, the cost of financing they can comfortably build at least in their own minds they can build in interest rate increases more comfortably and mm -hmm. hey, if interest rates don't rise, great. I've got that much more cushion. And if they decline on a go forward basis, maybe that even gives me greater, you mm -hmm. know, uh, flexibility. And 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 plus, I think a lot of that, um, a lot of this uncertainty too, sort of plays into the outlook on a macroeconomic, you know, environment as well. So companies are trying to forecast, you know, next year's earnings for 2024. Obviously, there's a lot of macro, you know, things going on in the world, geopolitical, you know, factors and. <laughs> You know, supply chains, are, energy. I mean, like it's yeah, just yeah. It's, all of that, you know, notwithstanding, I think you take you know the interest rate you know component out of it. It, it, it kind of just is one less variable that's that's out there that that people have to think through, um, you know, with as much concern. So it's so an where is that I, set, where is that settled out um, with like like multiples and deal structures? Yeah, yeah. So I think what's happened is um, we've actually seen a slight improvement in multiples. Um, I think a little bit of that is a function of the fact that the volume of transactions are down. So, so those companies that do come to market are likely really high quality companies. Mm. And so that's captivating a lot of interest, right? Because, because the volume is down and there's not so many opportunities to pursue when something good does come to market. Um, now you've got this, this really, you know, highly sought after asset that's coveted. And anytime that happens, if it's a sort of an auction environment, it tends to drive up, you know, the, yep. the price. And so that, that's helped create a little bit of a floor, I think, on multiples it. Yeah, and, yeah. and helped to actually increase, you know, that competitive dynamic has helped to actually somewhat increase, um, you know, some pricing multiples from what might have been the case in the, in the preceding. Is time. that helping with deal structures too then? Yeah, I think the deal structures are largely similar um, in a lot of ways. I don't think there's been a, you know, a, a very, what I would say, significant change um, in deal structures in the last 90 days. Um, I think that environment is, is pretty much kind of, you know, and last, la if I recall, Jeff, last time we were talking, there was a little bit more towards an earnout or rolled right. equity. Cause maybe, maybe speak again, just a little bit to like the valuation gap, like one, and it's, it's sounds like it, the supply demand thing is helping kind of flow, uh, even that out, but like how to maybe kind of uh, touch on the valuation gap and how rolled yeah. equity and some of the deal structures play a part. Yeah, because the interest rate rise over the course of the last several, you know, um, you know, 18, 24 months, obviously the, the impact of that is to lower valuations because, again, you can only afford to pay for a company so much based on its cash flows. And if you're paying more for debt, you know, that, that all factors into how you can how much you can finance and afford to pay. And so what we saw for a long, long time was there were a lot of sellers that were still hoping for and expecting to get prices they could have received back and call it 2021. <laughs> and that environment was gone. Those prices were largely not being, you know, it was very difficult to find someone willing to pay those prices. So the expectation 
between what sellers wanted to get and what buyers were able to and willing to pay was was large. And so the the idea of an earnout is um, commonly normally you know commonly used very customarily used to kind of breach that gap to say hey you know buyers would say hey I, I can't pay you that value up front I have to pay you a lesser value up front but maybe if you deliver this level of earnings over time um, through this concept of an earnout we can get you the type of value that you're hoping to get today um, and, and so that's that certainly the use of that it, it, you know has has been uh, much more prevalent. Um, mm-hmm. the last 18, 24 months. I think that still exists today, even though we've seen some improvements and some of the pricing multiples have come up and it's helped shrink that gap. It's not completely, you know, offset the total gap that buyers and sellers are, are, are hope, you know, where uh, the, the difference lies. And so they're still, right. you know, very much heavily uh, utilized presence of, of earnouts and transactions. Well, I just think about just the, just the unknowns of so many things, Jeff. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, how, how, what's the chatter going on with the conversations? Cause like, if I were just to like, I mean, I just think about our clients um, and I- interesting couple of thoughts is like, well, I mean, people are trying to forecast out it's annual planning. We're trying to do our rolling budgets towards the target equity valuation. It's like, well, we got supply chain issues. We got, mm-hmm. you know, inflation from, you know, salaries and payroll and energy and like all these different components. Like what's the conversation and we're going into an election season. So like, yeah. what's just the temperature of the people that you're talking to? I mean, like, how are they thinking about all this stuff? Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny you, you mentioned that because I just had a conversation with a couple of CFOs this week for some clients of ours, and they're going through their annual budgeting process, and they were just kind of wanting to get on the phone and you know talk through some concepts and what they're seeing and pick our brain a little bit. And um, naturally, the conversation turned to, well, you know, how has this year been, right? And I think what surprised me is in those couple of instances, um, both CFOs said they had a great year, better than anticipated. And, and, and the reason for that, there was some segment of their business that unexpectedly did way better than they anticipated. Oh, interesting. And, and, and in one of the circumstances, for example, it, 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 um, our client is a company that is a distri- distribution business, but they have a rental piece to their, oh. to their model and they rent out equipment. And that rental business has done significantly better than anyone ever anticipated because of supply chains and the availability of equipment. And so they have a normal sort of cadence for how many you know pieces of equipment they'll rent on an annual basis, and it's been a fairly predictable cadence over the last several years. But but this year, the the amount of rental equipment just doubled or tripled for lack of you know better. Is it lack lack of being able to buy something? Like I remember the Bobcats are like a hundred grand, zero percent down, no payments for fourteen months, and then it's zero percent for another sixty exactly. months. Exactly <laughs> because the OEMs are having difficulty manufacturing to the pace to get new equipment out. Yeah, the yeah. Markets increased, and and so um, that interesting dynamic was not sort of uh, predicted at the start of twenty three. It, mm-hmm. it realized throughout the course of twenty four. And so now the, the CFO is saying, you know, I, how, how am I supposed to budget for this on a go forward basis, right? I mean, that some of it might continue, but the reality is that a lot of it might wane. And yeah. and so like thinking just through, well, what can I anticipate on a go forward basis into 24? You know, the, the greater likelihood is that the, the rental market might come come back and return to a bit of a normalization, revert to the mean, and maybe the new equipment market's going to pick up again. And, and that sort of, you know, there's some differences in margins there you have to think through, but but I think um, in large part, the, the sentiment is that a lot of people um, and a lot of businesses and the, the executive teams that we're talking to, at least right now, feel pretty good about 24. You know, there's always like moving pieces. Yeah. There's moving yeah. pieces and one part of the business may be down because it reverts to a norm, but the others are expected to increase off maybe a little bit of kind of this more of a trough area where they've been. And so when you add, you know, everything together, collect it together, yeah. it aggregates to a level that's, you know, maybe growth year over year to some degree, which yeah. I think is good. So like, th- I think that this is unbelievably important to highlight, Jeff, because I was watching the the webinar with Brian um, and your managing partner. Um, I forget his name. Um, what an awesome webinar, by the way, it was an hour and I took a screenshot of every single one of their PowerPoint slides, but like it was, ta- it was, it was talking about the slight dip in 2024, maybe towards the end of the year, but then it's growth. And the main street media, I mean, my God, like just the total dumpster fire that it is, is just like the clickbait. And I, and I, I think it's just, it's messing with people's heads about what to forecast out. And there was a, so many takeaways that we don't, obviously people can go pay for the webinar or go to it if they want to, but there was a there was quite a few um, kind of highlights that I wanted to get your take on. One is that, um, 
uh, what was it? What's your managing partner's uh, name? I I think you're in front of Keith Butcher. Yeah, it was Keith. Yeah, it was Keith. And, it was Keith and Brian. So they were talking, and I was I did I did not know that Butcher Joseph actually had a portfolio of businesses too. So like you guys, your credibility continues to go through the roof with me because you guys are just you're you're in the arena with everybody else, sure. and you were talking about resilient segments and industries mm -hmm. and i think that kind of ties into what you were talking about here different lines of businesses can you kind of explain what you guys mean by resilient and how you're thinking about the next uh you know 12 to 24 months yeah i mean i, I think when we think through the resilient is those types of uh businesses or lines within a, an organization that can kind of withstand um you know some of these these shocks to the macroeconomic system generally they're they're going to be businesses that we think of as being a little bit more sticky uh, with their customer base that, um, you know, are, are um, um, types of um, services or um, uh, types of uh, Is equipment essential, that are, thinking, are like... essential, yep, essential to businesses and their ability to continue to operate, um, you know, that regardless of, you know, the macroeconomic economic environment, mm -hmm. you know, you still need certain things, right? Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. those certain things are what we think of obviously as being very resilient to cycles. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so th those are the types of things that we kind of think about when we use that terminology. I, I was thinking, I think the example they're using, I just was like, oh my God, it's so fascinating. If I had all the data behind it, it's like, um, I don't remember if, you, if it's a portfolio company of you guys, but like, it, was it was it washers and dryers and like they were talking about like the parts and the consumables and yeah. like the essentially the lower you know the lower end machines are now going through because of multifamily and the higher end ones are now down. I mean so like when you say it's almost like a b balanced ETF portfolio where you're kind of like you're still going up but it's like way different of the things that are actually in demand. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, and and you know that diversification of these businesses and different having different SKUs. So when, you know, high end, you know, talking about washers and high end washers, maybe, you know, more in, in decline, more of the commoditized lower end of the marketplace kind of helps to offset that. So you get two steps forward, one step back for, for a lot of these businesses. So, um, well, Jeff, one of the one of the most um, uh, the, the highest volume takeaways of the, the presentations and the workshops I've been doing with our combined audience, you know, the Vistage or the middle market entrepreneurs is this normalized EBITDA. I'm just beating yeah. into everybody's heads. Normalized EBITDA, increase the increase EBITDA, increase the multiple de and uh, pay down debt. But the, the normalized EBITDA, what I think has been very uh, attractive to people, at least in how I'm describing it, is the ability to tell the story of your business through yeah. those normalization events. Mm -hmm. And coming from the fact that you guys do third-party sales to private equity and uh, uh, strategics, but also to ESOPs, mm -hmm. can you explain like, all the things that we're talking about, you can tell that story in the trailing 12 months of EBITDA. So can you explain like just when you're representing a business, how mm -hmm. do you describe what we're talking about using the normalized EBITDA? Or like how do other buyers perceive it? Because it's like this matching of the story being told and the confidence of whether the person believes them or not, right? I mean, that's really what we're all talking about. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, normalizing of EBITDA can, can you know, be a topic for up cycles as well as down cycles, right? And because in, in an up cycle, you know, as you might imagine, buyers are sitting there saying, okay, well, is this level of EBITDA sustainable? Or is it, uh, you know, is, is it impacted by some non-recurring one-time things that aren't- Kind of like the rentals you're talking about, like the increase in rentals, exactly. right? Exactly, yep. Like that's one of them or, you know, um, e even macroeconomic cycles coming out of the pandemic for a lot of industries. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we have steel industry client where, steel prices, you know, ramped up. Now steel is inherently a cyclical industry, right? So some, there's a lot of, you know, general understanding of cyclical industries about just the, the changes um, over the, a cycle and how that can impact even mm -hmm. now, but coming out of the, out of the pandemic, steel prices were at astronomically high levels that were unprecedented. And so in that industry, again, you're, you're thinking through, well, we know that's not probably not going to be sustainable. Um, and, and that'll revert to the mean. So you have a lot of those topics of conversation in instances where, you know, EBITDA is higher than what, you know, buyers would perceive would be sustainable and what a seller can deliver on a go forward basis. On the flip side, you know, you have instances where, hey, maybe my EBITDA is a little bit lower than it is, than, than, than a sustainable because I've incurred something that, again, is impacting my earnings on a negative basis that is not recurring. Or mm -hmm. maybe I, even I made investments in my enterprise in, um, in, in this most recent year that are going to lead to incremental sales and incremental earnings next year. And so mm -hmm. 
the, the current depressed level of earnings is not also representative of what a sustainable level of EBITDA is. And so mm-hmm. that's a big part of challenges too in the marketplace when we're talking about sort of this deal volume and why maybe um, the, the activities levels have waned a little bit because not only do you have interest rates, not only do you have macroeconomic concerns, <laughs> not only have this big difference in expectations and value, but part of it is like, okay, what am I supposed to underwrite to in terms of a, a normalized, sustainable level of EBITDA? And you really I feel have- like you value you know, like the Wizard of Oz here with like a crystal ball. You're like, that's one hell of a story you're trying to articulate, yeah. right? You really have to, you know, as, as advisors to businesses and trying to craft that story, you really have to dig into the numbers and the business model, right? To understand mm-hmm. like all of the nuances of the organization and the impacts that that um, you know, or the the factors that led to a particular impact on a company's earnings to be able to be able to explain the story in a way um, that you know either party can <laughs> with you know some elements of conciseness and brevity of course helps um, because I think that um, in in environments like this you know where you have a lot of uncertainty and concern and changing variables there is going to be a lot of greater emphasis on understanding not only a business model, but also what are those level of earnings that you can underwrite to that is sustainable, particularly when you're putting debt on the balance sheet, mm-hmm. right? Well, and they, you that's might be like able to take I... a flyer. If everything is great and rosy and ra- rainbows <laughs> in the world, you might take a flyer. But today, you're really going to dig in and understand that because uh, of where we are in this environment. Well, and, and, and I, thank you so much for that, Jeff, because like what I've been trying to explain – Is like I like and and I'm curious if you if you find this to be true too. like every business owner that has ever been in any of our workshops or any of the keynotes or any of our clients. I have always seen that they can tell an amazing story of where they've been, where they are and where they want to go. And then we say prove it. And then it's bubble charts and PowerPoints. And it's like, well, we can't underwrite a PowerPoint. Right. And so it's like at the end of the day, it's just telling a story. And most people can. They just miss the financial proof behind the story. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I think that's exactly right. And, and a lot of times, you know, the uh, the founder owners have a lot of um, emotional uh, dialogue around the business and how they're going to do this, right? And it's um, it's it's because they've got this experience and 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 they've got a different perception of perhaps risk having that experience mm-hmm. than someone external to the business, a third party who has less familiarity with that particular enterprise does. Mm-hmm. And so it's hard to translate this just like ideas and concepts that, oh, I know this, it's, we see it all the time, into something more tangible, taking an intangibility, mm. a philosophy, a feeling, a gut impact that a founder owner has, and converting that into something tangible to help bridge those perceptions of risk. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love it. And so um, I, I know as we're getting close to our time here, my, one of the things that I had, uh, I had a couple ones that we can just kind of uh, uh, briefly touch on. One is um, I want to talk about what are your thoughts about banks lending and some of the banks? And then um, yeah, if, you, if you wanted to touch in just a little bit operationally of like, as we go into kind of some of these un- uncertainties, how people are operationally tightening things up. But what about, let's start with the banks, Jeff. Like, and this is just my thoughts, man. And, 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 I, and I'm still like, I think about the commercial real estate dumpster fire that's kind of just sitting there percolating that we, we kind of talk about, but there's no dominoes falling yet. Is that something similar to them with what's going on with the PE debt that people have on or bonds? And we just look at this kind of inverse situation with the banks and their balance sheet and their cash flow. Like, mm-hmm. how is that impacting their desire to continue lending? Yeah, I think, you know, um, we're, what we've seen is, it, it, at least in this environment, um, it's sometimes challenging for commercial banks and lenders to get really comfortable with lending into situations that aren't going to be what we would call a productive use of debt, right? So what that would mean is something like a a dividend recap or some sort of um, buyout of a shareholder. Um, that's not productive debt in the sense that it's not going to grow a business, mm-hmm. right? And those types of transactions are hard right now for, for banks to get comfortable in lending to, because it's unproductive, it's not going to lead to more revenue. It's not going to lead to more earnings. So I think, you know, a lot of banks have kind of pulled back on the circumstances of lending into those types of transactions. Would, would that include internal transfers to like a management buyout or just sure. specifically? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. 
Um, you know, and, and, and I think where banks get more comfortable is those transactions that they can clearly see are going to lead to more productive uses of cash that can be, that can be used to grow the business, right? So uh-huh. maybe acquisitions, for example, they can Strategic, see, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's an opportunity here to, 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 for this business to, to grow through acquisitions. There's an accretive acquisition that they're pursuing and we can see how that's going to generate more revenue and more earnings. And so banks can get their arms and, and have a little bit more comfort around that mm-hmm. than, than in other circumstances. I think, you know, credit is still pretty tight. Mm-hmm. Credit is still pretty tight for sure. So when banks are willing to lend into a circumstance, you know, I think they're still going to be pretty cautious. Um, their underwriting committees and the credit committees are still going to be obviously very diligent about understanding the risks inherent mm-hmm. To a particular business and enterprise, and they're in markets. Um, they're, they're probably not going to be, um, do we, you know, they, they've tightened the credit in, in the sense that they're not going to lend as, as deep into the capital structure. Whereas, in, for would that know, be say like mul- that, how many multiples that they're yeah, going to finance? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. What I mean by that is, if two years ago you could get three times your EBITDA in debt, perhaps that's you know. That's that's definitely come back to say two and a half times, you know, your mm-hmm, EBITDA. Mm-hmm. So those types of things continue to exist, um, but in the right circumstances, banks are still willing to lend, and you know, we're still seeing you know High quality companies, right? Yeah. There's there's this trend like, hey, build a good company, and it's not going to be a problem. Yeah. And it, so is it is it safe to say kind of like the internal buyouts that makes sense because it's non productive? Is private equity kind of viewed the same way then? And then we kind of have like ESOPs where there's more free cash flow because of the savings and taxes and then strategic buyers. It, it kind of just like the yeah. logical chain of like, hey, what's the risk? Yeah, I think exactly. I think when you're talking about a private equity firm coming in for the first time to buy a business initially, and they're putting that non-productive debt on the balance sheet, right? Um because again, it's a leveraged buyout. Mm-hmm. You know, again, banks are going to be a little bit more cautious, right? Now, that's not to say you can't transact with a private equity firm. It just means that the private equity firm probably has to put in more equity. So, is that is it? Would you say is it? And I'm not saying because I, I didn't uh, see this in the data, but is platforms a little bit more suppressed now, where like a bolt-on still could hold true because the platform is just a financial buyout, and then yeah. the, the bolt-on. Sweet. Exactly. You beat me to the point, which is uh, exactly. <laughs> I didn't mean, even, didn't mean to do that. <laughs> no, no, that's great. That, that was a great segue. The tuck-ins, again, because that's perhaps more productive, right, in, in, mm-hmm. in, in a lot of ways, because you've already got a platform business, and now you're making an acquisition to buy another business you can tuck in. It's going to grow your revenue, going to grow your earnings, going to generate some synergies. So it's the same concept, mm-hmm. you know, uh, that we already, you know, discussed um, earlier that, Sweet. yeah, there, there are some differences well, it makes it, and I think that's very, very helpful for the listeners in because they're always wondering, like, what is the different options? How does that impact my deal structure, the valuation, and then what's going to happen to the business afterwards? I mean, it's just yeah. a decision tree, and the more people understand, it's not neither good nor bad. It's just expectation setting, and then kind of moving then into the next segment as we're wrapping up here is like uh, it. Like when um, Keith and Brian were talking about, I don't know how they worded it, Jeff, but I loved it. But they called it like balance sheet battles or something like that. And mm-hmm. they like, and again, for the listeners in here, we won't geek out too much, but the cash conversion cycle, the working capital, like really matters now. Like you can't pay payroll with receivables. I mean, you can yeah. if you finance, but we won't get there. But like, you know, we have receivables, payables, and inventory. And like when you're thinking about, you know, taking someone to market, like, and you're looking at how they're treating those things, can you just kind of like put your, the investment banking hat on the buyer hat and saying like, how, what are you looking for and how well someone's managing their cash and how that would impact just the kind of the health of the business? Yeah. Well, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, the two critical pieces of course are receivables and payables. And what you typically see in these types of environments and cycles is people want to collect their cash faster and they want to pay their bills slower. And, and obviously, that get, the, the faster you can collect the cash and the slower you can pay your bills, then, you know, that, that's improving your, your cash conversion cycle and your working capital and helping you. And you, it, the inverse, if you're paying quick and getting paid slow, means that, you know, you have to either use cash in your balance sheet or your borrowing capacity on your line of credit to finance that working capital until you can collect your bills, right? And so... When you're thinking about the health of a balance sheet, buyers of businesses like the fact that you can collect and can convert your receivables to cash quickly because then you have to use less debt, right? Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. When, you're, when you're out in the marketplace um, and, you're, and you're talking to buyers of businesses, that is particularly you know, a, a, a conversation of particular importance um, you know, because it, it, it means that, again, if you're trying to underwrite to a business to put more debt on the balance sheet, if you're 
if your if your cycle is working against you and causing you to draw on your line of credit, it means you have less availability in your balance sheet to borrow for whatever the transaction is going to yeah. be. Yeah, it's all cash you have out, right? Yeah. Reserve. You have to earmark and reserve that liquidity just for working capital purposes. Maybe that yeah. stops up all your borrowing capacity. And so, gee, now right. I don't have enough to you know finance the acquisition or you know do what else I was planning to do. I, yeah, that webinar I was watching with Keith and Brian, man, they had some crazy tactical things that I was like, man, that is genius of like how to get your money in. I'm like, but I think, you know, to your point, it's, you know, what's the confidence you're going to be able to pay, pay all your bills and be able to take the distribution, service the debt and paying attention to that stuff really matters now. And I think, yeah. you know, I mean, people are either using you for a bank or you're, you know, you're either the bank for other people or you're the bank for yourself. It's yeah. One of the two. Well, you have to be really, obviously, you always have to be mindful of that in any economic environment, right? But it becomes particularly important when you think like maybe your business is going to be stabilizing next year, or maybe there's concerns about the fact that, hey, you know, what happens in an environment where revenue declines and earnings decline, right? Now mm -hmm. that I have less of a runway uh, mm -hmm. to, to deal with mm -hmm. all these things. And so mm -hmm. those considerations get heightened in these types of environments and pe people get really laser focused on that. Um, they should, at least. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> not to say people ignore it or discount it in a good macroeconomic cycle, you know, but it, it just, you know, you really get more laser focused when. I don't know, Jeff. I'll tell you what, man, like my uh, my father always said, uh, and, I, and I will agree with him, is like, because we were in just an absolute crap storm um, after 09. And like we were, I mean, we were financing our receivables even before then because we didn't know any of this stuff, which is why I do all this stuff. And um, his phrase, and I will uh, agree with it, is we do our best work in the worst times and our worst work in the good times. Because like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, we got enough cash. Right? We'll just do this, that. And all of a sudden, you don't have any cash and you care a lot. Yeah. yeah. Uh, unless, unless, unless and you're managing it like we're talking about. And that's whole like, regardless of what season we're in, we should be doing yeah. what we're talking about. Yeah, no, it, it, that's exactly right. I mean, you, it, you see it all the time, you know, I mean, when, when we have a down cycle, but people start to look really, you know, much more closely, businesses look much more closely at like their expense profile and they right. figure out ways to cut costs. It's right. Right. And then, and then, and then in the up cycle, they, they pay less because they're managing so much revenue and their sales are great. And it's, we, oh, we don't have the time to worry about this. Yeah. But the great thing about it is in those down cycles, because they become better businesses and managing their expense profile, when the cycle turns, they get an immediate benefit to the margins. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. That lasts for a while. You got a l nice runway. And then, of course, things get a little loose again. And come yeah. <laughs> back, to the, back to the cycle that the, uh, the Billy Brothers are always talking about. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much. Um, is there anything that I didn't ask that I should have before we wrap up? Um, I don't think so. I think we covered a lot today. And, uh, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Yeah, hopefully pretty uh, uh, helpful for everybody. I appreciate it. And um, again, everybody reach out to Jeff and Butcher Joseph if you're looking for any kind of valuation or any of the different exit options. I mean, they've been great. We've referred a couple of people over to you guys. And I just love your your objective approach because you do third parties, internal buyouts, ESOPs. You're not going to push people to a specific exit option. I just absolutely love it. Yeah. Yep. No, we, uh, we enjoy our time with you. Thanks for uh, the conversation again today. Great to see you. Have a good Thanksgiving. Yeah, likewise. All right, thanks.